the bigger your firm gets, the more important it is to make sure that everybody's pretty much continually on the same page. Episode 124. This is The Business of Architecture. Welcome back, Architect Nation. This is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. If you believe that it's possible to make money and do good, then this is the show for you. If you aren't already on the Business of Architecture email list, make sure you claim your free account on businessofarchitecture.com by clicking the green Join Today button. I'm your host, Enix Sears. Today's show is sponsored by BQE Software, the makers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice is the office and project management software built with the needs of architects in mind. And for a limited time, startup firms can get two free seats of ArchiOffice for a year. Go check it out at ArchiOffice.com. Welcome back, Architect Nation. Glad to have you as always. Want to remind you that the Business of Architecture Summit is coming up in about a month, the October 29th and 30th. And if you haven't already gotten your tickets, jump over there. It's one of the smallest investments you can make to get some of the most cutting edge business information for your firm. I want to welcome my guest today, who is a big time thought leader, expert on growing firms strategy, uh, the author of the book Leading Firms, which I have right here, How Great Professional Service Firms Succeed, and How Your Firm Can Too. So I, I think we're in for a great conversation. This is a subject that anyone in the right mind is going to want to learn more about. So I'd like to welcome to the show David Coleman. He's a partner at Axiom Consulting Partners. David, welcome to Business of Architecture. Great to talk to you, Enoch. David, tell us a little bit about Axiom and what Axiom does to give us a frame of reference. So Axiom uh, Consulting Partners is a, a boutique consulting firm, and we help our clients, uh, as we would put it, connect their their strategy, what they're trying to accomplish as a business, to the way they're organized, how the boxes and lines and the work processes work, and then the people that do it. So if you imagine that as a triangle, our goal is really to help organizations sort of connect those three things. So we work with a wide range of clients on everything from how they're structured, how they grow revenue, the kind of people they have, the jobs those people have, how do you motivate and retain them? How do you find the ones you need? How do you make the leadership, get the leadership team on board and all of that? As you can imagine, um, a pretty high, uh, pretty high percentage of professional firms and architecture firms are included are, since they're basically built out of people, this idea of aligning people with the jobs they do and what the firm's trying to accomplish is is uh, pretty much in our sweet spot. So that's that's really uh, how we end up. We as a firm end up doing a lot of work with a pretty wide range of professional firms. Okay, and David, I know you have a, an extensive background in uh, human resources management, development, leadership development. What would you say if you had a magic superpower? What is your own personal kind of specialty, passion, or superpower? I would say that um, uh, my specialty magic superpower is if if you think about what you're trying to do as a firm and you draw a circle and you think about what my people are willing to do and you draw another circle, the reality is change only happens where those two circles overlap. So if I've got any kind of a superpower it's helping clients understand where is that overlap, how do we stretch it, and how do we drive change through it? How do we figure out how to get done what we're trying to get done through people that, bless their hearts, have an opinion, have a background, have biases, prejudices, and, and willingness to do or not do what you want them to do? And I would say we're we're reasonably good at that. We're reasonably good at helping um, firms connect with their people and get what they need done in a way that makes everybody sort of feel involved and empowered. How does that, what does that process look like in terms of, first of all, identifying the firm leader's culture and philosophy, what they want to get done, and then aligning the organization to that? 
So, so it's really it's it's really a two step process. Um, uh, number one, uh, most firms are pretty clear on what their challenges are. You know, you have to you have to consider that if you're a leader in a in a, in a professional firm, you've started your own business, you've developed a client list, you've started to grow your business. You're pretty smart, and you know pretty much what you're, what you're doing. But the first step really has to be um, outlining and getting really clear on what do you want, why do you want it, what's it, how is that important to the business, and what are you willing to give up, and where are you willing to where are you willing to flex? Okay, and so in a lot of ways, sometimes there are ahas in that process. Sometimes. Clients say, Eureka, I, you know, thank you for this brilliant insight. I didn't realize this was a problem and so on. But in many cases, it really is a matter of getting clear on a lot of things that are instinctive. What's important about doing all of that is that's really what fuels the second step. Because the second step is to, is to, is, you know, look, I, I, to be blunt, we're big, I'm a big believer in transparency. You frame up the case and you put the case to your people. Okay, you got to take that message. You know, here's what's going on. Here's what we stand to gain. Here are the problems with it. Here are the things we consider. And you've got to put that to the people. There is a technique side of that, um, which uh, which I talk about in my book, which um, is is really pretty obvious when you think about it. Which is, if you're a leader in a firm, you figure out about fifty percent of what you want to do. Okay. And then you go out to your people and you say, you know, I've got this about 30% figured out. What do you think? What's going to happen? Number one, they're going to tell you some things about the, the next 20% that you hadn't thought of, right? Number two, they're going to make suggestions that you've probably already thought of but haven't told them about. And they're going to help you look around the corner to... What's it going to take to finish it? That just enables you to engage folks in a dialogue. You got to respect that they're probably as smart as you are. And if you're a good leader, they're probably smarter than you are. Right? But you go back and forth. You say, you know, we got this 20%, 30% figured out. What do you think? And they'll tell you about the next 20 or 30%, even though you pretty much have an instinct. You work on it a bit more, and then you go out to them again. And you say, you know, we got this about 80% figured out, even though you're pretty sure you know what you want to do. And then they're going to tell you in that process, you know, what's wrong with your idea? They're, you're going to debate it back and forth and so on. But what's ironic is, and, and I've been doing this now for, um, oh, good golly, 25 years. Um, what's ironic is if you go through a process like that, you will tend to get the support from a from a lot more people, and frankly, from a surprising percentage of the people who would otherwise disagree or not want to go along. Simply that process, of, let's sit down and let's talk this through. Let me be transparent. Let's talk about this. Let's talk about the business case. Really improves people's willingness to come and engage in, in potential solutions. It's not rocket science, but it really is that process of negotiating that overlap spot between what you as the leader of the business want and what your people are willing to do. What do you find? Is there any common thread about what leaders of firms want? <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Um, and, and, I, and I'll give you two answers. One is the, one is the sort of the, the straight up answer which is um, the vast majority of leaders, regardless of what their people may sometimes think in their weaker moments, are really trying to figure out a way to build a vibrant, growing firm that's got a future. I mean, that really is, and that really kind of drives them. Um, that'll manifest itself in a bunch of different ways, but but that really is is the overarching motivation. I, you know, I have to chuckle because in many ways, 
um, the, the the kind of flippant or irreverent answer to your question is what do, what do a lot of firm leaders want? They want it to be easier. Um, uh, you know, a, a lot of our a lot of my clients, um, if they're really honest with you, they're continually impressed with um, how much hand holding they have to do, how much explaining how much repeating, how much sort of checking in with people. And I don't mean that in a people development sense. I mean, they're usually, they're just real, you know, they got to that position by being pretty good at developing people. I mean that in the, you know, do you understand what's going on? Can you play back to me what's going on? And what do you think we should do about it? And then I have to come back and have the same conversation with you a week later because I can't be confident that it's stuck. Right, and I, I do think that a lot of leaders sort of feel occasionally weary by by the sheer amount of sort of repetition and dot connecting they've got to do, and uh, they know it's part of the job. But you know, there is a little bit of a gee, couldn't I just send them a memo and they could read it, and because they're smart people, and it would all be good. And the reality is. Most professionals are um, what I, from time to time anyway, are what I call situationally illiterate. That is, if you're telling them something that they don't really want to, if, they're, if you send them a memo about something they don't really want to hear, they lose their ability to read, right? And I think that's wearing. Sounds like being a father or a mother. <laughs> there, there is a little bit. You know, it's funny. It's it. it there is something a little bit parental about it. Um, it's almost like being. Um, but it's 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 a it's a lot more like being the parent of an adolescent, who the worst possible thing you can do with is tell them what they should do because you know better. I mean, if you know the surest way, the surest, the surest way to get them to do the wrong thing, unless your kids are different than mine, is to tell them to do the right thing, right? Because they'll just, <laughs> you know, there is a little bit of a sort of you got to help them see it and understand it and be patient and lead them along, and it, you know, that metaphor works. It works perfectly, which is ironic, right? These are, you, know, you think about the people you interact with. These are some of the, you know, smartest, most accomplished, creative. You know, why do we need to do that? Well, the reality is you do. Well, it sounds like we're talking a lot about here about focusing on uh, development, development mm -hmm. of people, aligning people in terms of the vision of the firm and the culture of the firm. Mm -hmm. What are some best practices that you've seen, uh, some of the best firms out there that are doing this? What are they doing? So... Um, um, I divide it into two buckets. One, in terms of alignment. Um, the bigger your firm gets, and it happens pretty quick, right? It happens in three partner firms, four partner firms, five partner par firms. The bigger your firm gets, the more important it is to make sure that everybody's pretty much continually on the same page. You know, do we all want the same things or roughly, or are those things compatible? Um, do we all have the same vision of the kind of clients we want to, we want to serve who we're pursuing the kind of work we want, the kind of work we don't want. And so, um, firms that are successful invest a significant amount of time together, particularly as partners, but, but often all staff sort of, talking about the business. Now, I, I don't mean this in terms of, um, you know, every Friday afternoon we, you know, we roast marshmallows and make s'mores together and, and, you know, sing campfire songs. This is really about sort of periodically getting folks together to talk about what's going on, on the, going on in the business, talk about what we're trying to accomplish, talk in practical terms about, you know, we've got this social media marketing effort. How's it going? Is anybody getting any leads from it? How can I understand, um, you know, how am I supposed to process the fact that um, uh, we've only received half the contributions from staff 
to this effort that, you know, I'm not naming names, but, you know, let's talk that through together. You know, you sort of, you create a community and that really sort of helps people stay aligned. Um, I also think in that same bucket, um, a lot of um, firms that are successful don't assume they know what's going on. They ask. Right. And, and it's interesting. It's, it's, it doesn't have to be tedious, but it's, it's this whole management by wandering around, talking to people about what they're working on um, really is important because you get a feel for whether people are seeing and operating in the business in a consistent way. And I think that's I think that's really key to keeping people aligned. Um, you know, you, you also raise the issue of partner development um, or you know staff development, uh, which is the it's kind of the great untended garden of of the professions. Um, uh, and and what I tell you is the best. The, the, I think the best practice, there are two best practices in, in, in people development in firms. Um, uh, number one, you start teaching the business from day one. So you think about how you learned your trade, right? It's an apprentice business. All these are apprentice businesses, right? Yeah, you 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 know you you've got your degree, you've got you've got your license, and so on. But you really you learned your business by doing it shoulder to shoulder with more senior people. Most firms you say, you know what? If I teach you to be a good architect, I'm done. And I think that it's 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 actually kind of tragic because you've got um, experienced people you know, people our age who've got a wealth of knowledge just, you know, about interacting with clients and dealing with problems. And, you know, the first time, the first time, uh, you know, a young person in your firm really ticks off a client, right? <laughs> the reality, and, and as, I've, as I've said to colleagues from time to time, you know, the difference between me and you right now is what's just happened to you has only happened to me about 50 times more. And I think a lot of firms don't, don't sort of, and it's easy, right? Yeah, it's a little interpersonal discomfort if we're introverts, but it's it's reasonably easy to sort of share that knowledge and wisdom. And I think that's I think that's that's something that that great firms do. I think the other thing that great firms do is um, they assume that you're never done. Um, you know, the vast majority of us, I think. Um, when we, particularly if there are several partners and you know, we make a new partner and, you know, they've kind of grown up in the firm and we brought this person in and so on, it, we're done, right? They're a partner. They know what they're doing. And so I think, I think great firms expect growth from partners. I think they expect everybody to get better every year. It doesn't have to be astronomical at a certain point, but I, but I do think that creates sort of energy, openness flexibility and and kind of a, a kind of a collective wisdom in the firm if you do those two things and I, I think that makes an enormous difference over the long term and and uh, ironically enough it's not uh, it's not stuff you gotta um, go to a seminar to learn it's not stuff you gotta read a book to do but it is stuff you have to devote yourself to because it's not the normal course of business David, in your book, the subtitle is How Great Professional Service Firms Succeed and How Your Firm Can Too. You know, what what are some of the major points that you see in addition to what you already mentioned mm -hmm. about great professional service firms succeeding? Yeah, and I think it's um – I would say it's got it's there, there's sort of three layers to it. Number one, um, build a strong foundation. Re, um, you know your core your core processes, right? How are you going to manage your people? How are you going to generate revenue? Who's going to generate it? How are you going to make sure you get paid? How are you going to make sure you do quality work? There's just this 
foundation that every firm's got that every firm's got to build. Um, and without that, you're it's sort of you're running in sand. You know, you just you're you're never going to succeed. And so when you look at great firms, which do a ton of great things well, it's important to remember that they're built on that strong foundation. So that's the first thing. The second thing that um, I think successful firms do is they differentiate themselves in four ways. Okay? Um, number one, they have a bias to growth. They don't necessarily... Um, uh, I think most of the great firms I know, they don't believe in growth for growth's sake. But they do. You re, and 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 I know you'll remember it. One of your one of your interviews was about somebody who successfully founded the founded a firm in the midst of in the midst of the recession. How the heck do you do that? Do it by having a bias for growth. You do it for having an orientation towards being sort of scrappy and resourceful and continually growing and so on. And I think great firms do that. And I think that differentiates great firms. Um, secondly, um, they're good at their talent. They're good at finding people who fit, who've got, who are, um, who've got the core skills and then growing them up and keeping them. Thirdly, um, great firms project their brand effectively. It's a funny sort of thing, but, and even after having written the book, sometimes it, it just puzzles me. What great firms do is the face they project to the market is, is consistent and powerful and everything they do lines up with it. And so this idea of brand synergy, right? How does your social media fit in with your advertising and fit in with when, you, when you're sitting down with a client for the first time? Are all those things in sync with each other? Because there are a lot of firms out there that are very successful that have very powerful brands simply by sending consistent signals over a long period of time. So that's the third thing. And I think the fourth thing successful firms do built on that foundation is they reinvent themselves. It's kind of a flip side to that bias to growth, but they're kind of always exploring the edges. We've got a great thing. Are there other great things we can be doing? We've got a great set of clients. Are there other related sort of clients that aren't necessarily in our core client set that we could go talk to them? So there really is a real sort of push outward at that sort of competitive envelope that keeps them relevant over time. And, you know, I think that's it. I think it's, it's a foundation because otherwise you're going to be behind all the time. And then it's, it's growth, projecting your brand, being good at talent, and reinventing yourself. Lots of stuff goes into that, but I think that's what great firms do. And David, in, in your work with Axiom, what, what market sector do you generally work with? Are we talking uh, professional services accounting firms? Is there one particular kind of professional service firm that makes up the bulk of, of your work? Um, it's pretty evenly balanced uh, among public accounting firms, um, uh, consulting firms. So that you know the McKinsey, the Bain, McKinsey's, the Bain's, the BCG's, and so on, and the law firms. I would say fewer law firms than the rest. And then there are various. We you know we serve we serve architectural and engineering firms from time to time. We serve specialty firms from time to time, uh, financial firms from time to time. But really, that strong core is is the accountants, the consultants, and the lawyers. So the the one that kind of sticks out in my mind there, which is kind of interesting, are the are the consultants, because it would seem that they are consultants themselves, probably doing similar things which you do for them to other firms. Uh, in many cases, in in many cases, well, in many cases they are, but in every case they do believe they can do it better. Whether they do or not, whether they can or not, they do believe they can do it better. Um. I do think that at some point, and I think this is a good lesson um, 
for your clients at some point that or, or, or for your listeners is at some point the accumulation of of good stuff you've done if you market it effectively if you get the word out starts to starts to overcome almost any barrier um, but the other the other element of that is uh, particularly savvy leaders in firms um, know that it's both tricky and sometimes to be blunt it's dangerous to try to work change from within. Um, a lot of what we do, look, don't get me wrong, we come to our clients with brilliant insights and, and thoughts that no human being has ever thought before. But a lot of what we do is about bringing the pieces together and working out what the solution is. Um, and sometimes that's a, that's a dangerous or a risky or a tricky process, right? If you were the best brain surgeon in the world, if you had a headache, you would not crack your own skull. You know, the, the corollary for lawyers is, you know, a lawyer who represents himself as a fool for a client. Now, you got the ego there, right? You got, you know, you've got the, the self-confidence, you know, this is... Um, we're you and your listeners and I are in tough business. It takes a fair amount of self belief and a pretty darn strong ego to do this. It's hard to overcome that. But I do think there is among a lot of firms, at least we've found an awareness that having a good partner to sort of work through it as necessary. Um, you know, if there's tough stuff to be said, um, you know, let me say it. It's, yeah. I'm, I'm pretty good at saying tough stuff in a way that's not judgmental so that you don't have to say it and have all your people have all that sort of negative, oh, my God, critical energy come flying at you. Let it fly at me. You know, that's, that's part of my job. So what, what are some tough things, David, that you've had to say to clients? So I'll, uh, I'll give you uh, – I'll give you – two examples one's uh, one's sort of sort of broader and organizational and one's one's a little sort of personal and leadership coaching you know we had a client one of the uh, one of the uh, public accounting firms that um, basically you know these are if you're a big enough firm you can sort of plan in the future right we know it takes 10 years to create a fully functioning accountant and it takes five more years after that to turn him into a partner. And they kind of came to the realization that um, they were losing too many people in years two or three or four to have enough partners 15 years from now to sort of hold the firm together. I mean, it was really sort of a Oh my God, we can, you know, we can see that the tank is going to run dry here. Key insight. Yeah. And, and, and to their credit, that was their insight, not ours, but we came in and we helped them take apart, take it apart. And fundamentally, um, they, um, they were doing it to themselves. Um, they were, um, not really, they were treating people as units of production rather than people. And they had built all their systems and processes based on a belief of the kind of people we really kind of wish and hope we sort of had and we knew we had 15 years ago that aren't really the people we got. And I remember sitting with their chief operating officer and going, kind of going through, here's what we found and so on. And at some point, the, the, the um, chief operating officer sort of sat up in his chair and he said, you're telling me we've done this to ourselves. I said, yeah. Yeah, I am. Which makes it pretty easy to sort of stop doing it to yourselves, but you, you know, you're going to have to kind of rethink the kind of the fundamental how you're going to engage with these folks because you're pretty much doing it completely wrong. So that's one instance. I, you know, there is a um, – the other case is uh, I was working with a managing partner who was, uh, you know, in many cases the biggest learning challenges for for strong managing partners come from their own great strengths and from their good intentions. 
and this was a managing partner who believed a, a great deal in transparency. You know, we're partners. We're I won't be transparent. Well, you know, yes, transparency is good, but total transparency is not. So, you know, you get on a you're sitting with a bunch of your colleagues and um, you're talking about rebuilding the uh, rebuilding the computer system in the firm because it's outdated and we haven't done it in 15 years and we're going to have to make an investment and so on and so on and so on. Um, and one of the partners raises his hand and says, how much is this going to cost each of us exactly? And in front of all his partners, he answered the question. Now, you know, I'm kind of oversimplifying the situation and so on, but it was one of those things where all the rest of the leadership of the firm was not prepared to sort of deal with all of the noise that created. And all of a sudden, the whole thing went up. You know, everybody's was was up, and I, oh my God, our all of our incomes are going to be down by fifteen percent every year for the next five years as we pay for this. Oh my God. I, well, no, not really, because we think we're going to get this, and we're going to get this, and we're going to get this, and, you know, it's not going to fall on everybody. And yeah. But you know what? The minute he said, well, I was being transparent. They asked the question, I answered it. You know what? You got to be a little more cynical and manipulative about this. Don't deny him the information, but you got to be able to take a pause. And there was a moment where I, and a uh, very good relationship with this guy, uh, where I basically said, you know, that was stupid, right? <laughs> I, I, was, I was being transparent. But yeah. But look what happened. So, I mean, it is a little bit of that. You know, we presume that leaders um, come into their jobs fully for formed and fully capable. And the reality is, you know, they got to learn their jobs. So, you know, there's there's the sort of the ordinary, not ordinary, you know, um, uh, is I've seen partners that are partnerships that are sort of fractured into camps and, and you know, you got one side of the, one side of the office is not talking to the other side of the office because there's a disagreement over this or that or the other thing. And, you know, there's a fair amount of sort of marriage counseling that has to be done, you know, that kind of stuff. Um I think leaders sometimes hold on to um, um, hold on to folks too long who are not performing well. That is often a very difficult conversation, um, and it takes a couple of forms. You know, you have people who really are not up to the job, but they're really sort of good folks, and then you have people who are um, high performers but are kind of toxic. And I remember I was on a, a, the, uh, where was I? I was on, I think I was on an airplane with a managing partner of a firm and we were talking about somebody who ran their, I guess it was their third largest office. And there was a, there was a moment where I turned to him on the plane. And I said, do you realize that within the f next five years, you're going to get rid of this guy, right? Well, what do you mean? Well, because at the rate he's alienating his partners, you know, with a blah, blah, blah. Well, but they're high performing. Yeah, I know. But if you sort of look down the road, this is going to be this, this, you know, let's face it, this is not going to end well. And you ought to start thinking about it now. Anyway, I, that's, that's the best I got for you on that one. <laughs> and that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. 
bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.